Welcome to TFE Live. This is our show number 270 for the 6th of March, 2020, a Friday. Welcome to everybody across the globe. We hope that you've had a good week since our uh, big show on Tuesday. It was quite quite a show indeed. And just before we get into this year's, uh, this, this day's, today's show, a reminder that we on Sunday here in the USA spring forward. The, the USA springs forward to summertime and that changes things for the next four weeks before you and europe spring forward and it changes things also down under because you are still on summertime on what we call daylight savings time so long story short next week on tuesday when we're at this again we will be live for you uh, at 2000 utc 2100 cet instead of the usual 2200 and now a four-hour difference at 0900 in New Zealand and 0700 in Australia until you all go off. Daily. I don't even talk about it anymore. It's too bloody confusing. I wish we'd just all stay on either summertime or not, and I think it'd be a lot easier for everybody. And the, uh, as you all know, the, 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 the original goal of saving energy it is quite the opposite now because of air conditioning and everything else. Yes, people like to go sailing in the evenings during their summer, but you can do that by going to work an hour earlier and leaving an hour earlier in my not so humble opinion. Julia, I trust you are well. I am. Any hot tips? No, not really. Julia, our coordinating producer, my co-host, always likes to say at this point. This is your grand opportunity. Like, share, and subscribe. Helps a lot. Does indeed. And if you're so inclined, go over to sailingillustrated.com, our main website, and become a patron via Patreon. And I'll tell you what, it's a big help. We really appreciate the support because this is viewer-supported media. We do have the odd ad, uh, sponsor, and we're getting more and more. In fact, today's show is brought to you by Clorox Disinfectant Wipes. <laughs> In honor of? <laughs> In honor of the coronavirus. Okay, that's a bit of a joke. But I... Um, I've been asked so much about coronavirus and are we going to do a show on it? And, you know, there, there's a wide range, as you know, Julia, between the uh, I'm your host, Tom Eamon, as you all know, uh, there's a wide range between the people and, and Jean-Pierre Keegan's friends are Fosy up in Montreal is taking his kid out of school. He's laid in supplies for at least six months and on and he's really done the full on prep. And then there are other people who kind of laugh at us and say, you know, this is you know, full on croutonicism and just why are you, pa and we're not panicking. Dependent, d pretend it's a regular flu season. And pretend it's the flu, but of course it seems to be a little more deadly and a little more contagious than the flu, but not as bad as the measles. Regardless, I want to thank Chris Musler, who was our guest on Tuesday, and that was a huge show. We had a lot of views uh, because Chris is a very popular guy and had a lot of interesting things to say, but also because of our segment on the, uh, the beleaguered and befuddled president of World Sailing. We're going to talk about him some more. I don't even want to mention his name, the crouton. But Julia is going tisk tisk. So we'll come back to that. Be polite. I am trying to be polite. Today's guest, as you will have seen in the promos, is Jenny Tullock. She's standing by here in the Bay Area. She was going to come on live here uh, in the studio and sit over there in the hot seat where we put our live guests between Julia and the, and the uh, control room here. But we thought and because of the coronavirus and because she and her husband James are going to get on a plane uh, this afternoon and fly back to the UK where they're currently living. And uh, we thought the discretion was the better part of valor. And to just be a good example, we would have her on by Skype. She's here in the Bay Area, but uh, we'll be coming on by Skype in a moment to join us for today's show. Okay, let's, with that, get into this segment about, before I bring Jenny and James. James is with her, too. James coming on as well. Uh, the crouton-in-chief, the beleaguered, befuddled president of World Sailing. This, I'm not even going to tell you what I think anymore. You heard what I thought on Tuesday. I'm now going to tell you what other people have, how they have responded and what they are saying since our Tuesday show. And I'm only playing three or four of these pieces that have been sent to me or I've seen online. And frankly, they're, they're, the, clean, they're the clean ones. They're the nice ones. And I know, Julie, you don't believe that. 
But the reaction, in fact, the reaction has been so strong, there is now a call coming from four corners of the globe for him to resign. I mean, people are just astonished. And I hadn't done that yet, but let, let's, let me take you through it. Gerald New of sailweb.co.uk, whom I've talked on the phone a couple times, and it runs a great sailing website, US, uh, UK rather, Focus, has put up a piece that said a row, a row, a row has broken out between World Sailing and Sailing Illustrated. The Amer- and I, I'm just going to read this because it's his version of what's happened, and you don't have to take my word for it has broken out between Sailing Illustrated and World Sailing. World Sailing President Kim Anderson accused Sailing Illustrated presenter Tom Eamon of publishing false statements about the W.S. financial position on the 18th January. It was really the 18th February show, Gerald, but small typo there. Anderson apparently informed the World Sailing Board about uh, that Eamon had mentioned World Sailing Vice Presidents Jobson and Perry, Gary Jobson and Scott Perry, as the source of the information indicating that World Sailing had financial problems. Well, everybody knows World Sailing has financial problems. They've admitted that themselves. It's just that it's several million dollars more than what they've said it. the problem is, their deficit going into this Olympic year. Anderson then drafted, I'm back reading this, Anderson then drafted a letter which he urged Gary Jobson and Scott Perry to sign. This they refused to do as they wanted to review the program, my 18th February program, content first. But, Gerald New says, the letter was sent to Eamon with Jobson and Scott Perry's electronic signatures attached without their permission. Okay, that's as I reported on Tuesday. Scott Perry then followed that letter with his own letter to Tom Eamon, quote, apologizing for the sad confusion in the unapproved letter and accepting that Scott mentioned on the program that the Scott mentioned on the program was Scott McLeod, not himself, Scott Perry. And that is also absolutely the truth. We were talking about the esteemed commercial director of New York Yacht Club's America's Cup team, American Magic, our longtime friend, very smart guy, Scott McLeod. Mr. Gerald New goes on to say, Eamon denies discussing the financial situation with either Jobson or Scott and Perry, and so do they, by the way. This seems to be another, quote, foot-in-the-mouth incident for the beleaguered, I would have written beleaguered and befuddled, beleaguered president of World Sailing who is facing an election at the end of his four-year term this November at the General Assembly. It's in October, November. Kim Anderson's position is surely untenable if this latest unnecessary action is confirmed and he should stand down immediately. It really is time for World Sailing to get its act together, and the sooner the better. Sailing, the sailors, and the many hardworking World Sailing members, and indeed volunteers, deserve better than this. Gerald New writing in, uh, on sailweb.co.uk. Again, that's his words, not mine. This on the front page of Sailing Anarchy a couple of days ago, the pithy, uh, Just Die, I'm sure they didn't mean, th- this is the name of a song, Sailing Anarchy and it likes to headline their articles with song titles. World Sailing President Kim Chaos Anderson forged the signature of World Sailing Directors Gary Jobson and Scott Perry in a letter to Tom Eamon. How Anderson has not resigned yet is beyond my comprehension and shows how utterly dysfunctional, if not corrupt, world sailing is. And that's Peter Houston in in New York State, Buffalo, New York. But wait, there's more. That was on Sailing Anarchy's front page a couple days ago. Now, these guys whom I've not met, I've talked to once or twice on the phone, are becoming quite popular uh, bloggers, vloggers in the uh, in Italy. And their names are Vittoria de Alpertis, who is the head of Quantum Italy, I believe he is the head of Quantum, and his sidekick Pietro Pinucci. And they are doing a really bang up job with a, a lot of different topics in the sport. And they're particularly focusing on the America's Cup and some of the technical things. And I commend their Facebook page to you. That's where they're doing it on their Facebook page. And it was quite interesting that they posted yesterday a video that the two of them sat and did and it's in italian but i'm still going to run the first few seconds of it la manina the world sailing which means i'm told by my italian friends 
the little hand of world sailing, which is a is a pejorative, a kind of a derogatory comment about Mr. Chaotic Kim Anderson using his hand to forge or for causing the staff to forge those signatures. Watch this. La manina di world sailing. Yeah. Sì. Ne succedono veramente esatto. di ogni, devo dire. Allora, come, come ha giustamente detto Michele Tognozzi, sì. ha riportato la notizia, perché anche lui si è sparato. Esatto. Il, <ride> il TFL Live, che esatto. è, uno, è uno show bellissimo, eh, che c'è ogni martedì e ogni venerdì, però esatto. un po' lungo. Però, esatto, ogni tanto soprattutto... Questo orientamento tenente alle due, è ormai alle due abbondanti. Esatto. Ok, for those, those of you who speak Italian, uh, and sometimes they do it both in English and in Italian, to this segment they have not at least yet, done in English, but I've had Italian friends tell me that the essence of what they have said is, quote, the fish stinks from the head, which, Julie, I think we would say the, the fish dies from the head, right? How do we say that in English? I don't know. I don't know that. Well, 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 you're from Stanford. We'll have to get Jenny Tullock, who's standing by. Oh, and knows how to, knows how and to she, fish. And she went to Harvard, so she probably knows And knows stuff. how to fish, too. She, right. I, I don't know about fishing, but <laughs> she said, do that again, Jen. She just went. <laughs> okay. We'll come back to Jen and James in a sec. Anyway, I commend their Facebook page to you. And as I said, it's just not the Anglo world that is coming down hard. Uh, it's a lot of others from around the world who just th have had enough of, of Kim Anderson and his lack of leadership, in fact, his croutonic leadership at World Sailing. And these guys make light of it. It is, again, my, I don't speak Italian, but those that have seen this just say it is a hilarious takedown of Mr. Well, you can see there now they've got the letter and the whole thing up there. Uh, clever guys. Uh, I've also heard from people in Denmark themselves who have who've been involved in yachting and yacht racing with Mr. Anderson for a long time, who just eviscerated him and his conduct when he was chairman of the Royal Danish Yacht Club that also, by the way, had serious financial problems, according to all reports. Okay, enough of all that. Um, I, another email that I received this morning from a senior serious person uh, in the Anglo world and he, he actually is, knows Mr. Anderson, has been advising him, um, he tells me. Kim Anderson must have had a brain fart. You'd figure he would have to know your first response. Your, I think it was a typo. Your first response would be to pick up the phone, which, of course, is exactly what I did. Called up Mr. Jobson, whom I know. I don't know Mr. Perry. I've never spoken with Mr. Perry and probably never will unless he becomes president of the World Sailing. He obviously has to resign. Otherwise, world sailing will be torn to, th to shreds. To shreds. And I think he's right. Chaotic Kim, and a few of you, I didn't start this, but a few of you are already using this hashtag, Kim resign now, exclamation point. I've seen that on other places. I haven't, you know, I'm putting it up there now, obviously. And I told you on... Uh, in the show on Tuesday, that Mr. Anderson is spending the few funds that the organization has to fly around the world to promote himself for president and offering his vision of reality. And I can tell you that yesterday he was in Israel. And, you, you know, there are, there are no secrets in this world, especially from us, right, Julia? Right. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and Mr. Anderson flew to Israel, as we told you on Tuesday he was, he was said to be doing, and he met with their chairman, that's Julie Amir on the left, Smotter Pintoff, who is their CEO, their second from left, and then, of course, Chaotic Kim. And then on the right is Ellie Zuckerman, who is Israel's Olympic chief, their, their head coach in charge of Olympic preparations. And I'm not going to tell you what I heard he offered them and the other countries in Group B, because Group B is Italy, France, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, and, and I'm not sure who else, but it's astonishing. He is going around trying to save his, his butt by making all sorts of offers to various countries. He's also been to Hungary, and we, we hear what he's telling them. He's trying to get rid of George Vassala, who's been an outspoken opponent of Mr. Anderson. Anyway, this has got to stop. He's obviously lost all credibility. With it, World Sailing has lost her credibility. We know the IOC is not amused. We are hearing from the highest levels. The guy's got to go. So what happens next? 
if he does resign. Well, the World Sailing Board of Directors would choose an interim president until the election coming up this at the annual meeting this November, December. And of these folks, um, here second from the left, I love to use my telestrator. Jenny, you see we've got a telestrator here. You like that? Uh, that is Scott Perry um, from Uruguay, who is would certainly be a leading candidate. He's, he's affluent. He's been around a long time. Senior serious sailor. South American speaks Spanish fluently, so the, the, the Hispanic Latino world would probably be supportive. Gary Jobson, also, they're the two senior vice presidents have been around for two terms and been in the organization for longer than that. Uh, I think Jan Dawson, who is here second from the right, is probably also very interested in becoming president. She's from New Zealand, and she's been championing this croutonic governance proposal to restructure the organization. They've spent way too much money on it, and they're, she's arguing that they should spend even more and have this extraordinary general meeting. She, only, only Ms. Dawson and Mr. Anderson are wanting to carry on with his EGM, virtually the rest of the world, with a few, few exceptions. But as we told you on Tuesday, we know that the Caribbean, the South Americans, the groups of countries in the Caribbean, the South Americans, the Middle, middle uh, Europeans and the Asian countries, to name just four large groups, are saying it's too expensive to have an EGM. It's ridiculous to try to make any changes at the point. You're going to be out, Mr. Anderson, we hope. They hope, a lot of people hope, come November. So let's just cool it and get on with trying to save the Olympics and this Olympic year and the two remaining Olympic qualifying regattas, which are in Genoa, one of the hard, in Italy, of course, one of the hardest hit countries with yes. respect to. Just haven't they canceled all their regattas? They've canceled. The FIV has canceled a number of regattas, but it's, you know, it's back on. It's kind of day to day. The schools are closed. Yeah. And we know that, um, well, let, we'll come to that in a sec. So that's the board of directors. We know that Mr. Anderson, as we told you, has, sadly and badly has five ring fever. And I can guarantee you that he's doing the same thing to the board that he did with my program. He went to the board and said, hey, Eamon said this, completely untrue, and then got them to try to, he tried to get them to sign that letter. He also goes to the board and says, hey, I was just at the IOC and having discussions. They said to do this and that. And then we talked to people, you know, senior serious people in the IOC. He said, no, that never happened. But that's his view of reality. He's trying to push through by not telling the truth to his board of what the discussions were with the IOC. If you don't believe me, read Richard Gladwell and the various reports he's made over the years where he has interviewed both Mr. Anderson and senior serious people in the IOC. Okay, five ring fever. So that begs the question of the day. Which is twofold. Should chaotic Kim resign, number one, and number two, will he? And put your, please, your, your, give us your answers in the comments, and we'll, Julia over there reading her computer and her phone will take some kind of an informal tally. You all can. Will he resign? Should he resign, and will he resign? Or should they just go into world sailing with a big case of these Clorox disinfectant wipes? And clean the place up. It's really unfair. There's so many people in the organization who bust their tails, bust their picks week in and week out to help run World Sailing, both the staff and the volunteers from all across the globe. We don't need this. We don't need to look like this to the IOC. Is it going to jeopardize our Olympic program? No way, because I'm going to tell you why we are so well situated with the uh, with the IOC and have been since the first games in 1896. Remember, sailing is one of the original sports. It's been in every Olympics except 1900 when there's there was no body of water near St. Louis that they, in those days, there is now, that was suitable for hosting an Olympic yachting regatta. Okay, that's uh, my favorite segment. A lot of you just really like this segment. This Day in History, and the year is 1964. And uh, before we get into this, I want to bring in, over in Richmond, California, our guests, our VIP guests today, Jen, Jenny Tullock, and her husband of what, only a year, is that right? 
James Espy, E-S-P-E-Y, from Ireland. Uh, Jen, of course, an American. They've been living in the U.K. for a while. Tell us uh, what you're doing in the U.K. Me- um, well, after the last America's Cup, so 2017 after Bermuda, I went across to do an MBA at Cambridge University. And I came out of that and I took a job with a company called Borrow a Boat. So I'm chief marketing officer at Borrow a Boat, which is essentially the Airbnb for boats. Borrow um, a Boat, the, the Airbnb borrow version boat. of borrow a, a, a boats instead of hotel rooms. Yes. And you can sort of say combine it with Uber because the boats are movable um, and then combine it a little bit with uh, booking.com or Amazon in that it's a marketplace that's not only just peer-to-peer, which Airbnb, I think, still is majority peer-to-peer, but we also work with uh, the majority of the charter companies around the world now as well. So um, there are a couple competitors. There's two U.S. companies that I'm aware of, but Borrow Boat's the biggest in the U.K. at the moment, becoming one of the biggest um, European players. So it's been really interesting and really neat. We live right in central London, which is complicated because James... uh, has some of his projects here in San Francisco, which I'm sure he'll talk about. Uh, James second. is working and, for Chris Welsh here in San Francisco, right? Who we had on yeah. the show not too long ago. And uh, hence yep. you're over in the North Bay where, where, uh, James, where Chris's yard is, the yacht yard and other facilities. In his house. Where, where the did the two of you, where did the two of you meet? Purpose James and Australia. I, yeah. Purpose Australia, yeah. So the ISAP world's 2011, um, he was training in the laser for the Olympics and I was still racing and mat racing for the games. And, um, we probably got together then in 2013 after the San Francisco America's cup, I went and joined the Volvo ocean race after that. And we started dating then. And then the complication of the, of the marriage, yeah, we, we had our paper wedding ceremony, we call it in San Francisco last year, uh, which was lovely. Um, so so just a, year. just a year ago. Yeah, a year ago, yes, a year ago, two days ago. Okay, exactly. well, yeah. congratulations, and hence yeah. this this little interruption for this day in history because we're almost on your just what two days past your one year wedding anniversary. Yeah. So we've got three auspicious days. Your anniversary two days ago, today is an auspicious day, and then yesterday as well. Do you know what happened in this day, Julia? Do you know what happened this day in history in nineteen sixty four? I'll give you some hints. It's election year. There's a hint. That's a dragon. That is the 1960 Olympics in Rome. Well, the the sailing was in Naples, in the Bay of Naples. And the dragon class. Okay, but this is 64. This relates to what happened in 64. I'm just giving you hints. You know who this is? This is also 1960, the Olympics. His Majesty. His Majesty who? Uh, well, do you guys know? Like, Speak up if you do. I have no idea. Uh, uh, yeah. Gold That's medalist. Uh, there, see his country code there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm giving you Denmark. clues. <laughs> yeah, the king's Greece, there. Says Greece. On it. Says Greece. On it. Right, Greece. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well done. So that is His Majesty King Constantine of Greece. Well, he was not the king. He was the crown prince at this point. And he won a gold medal in the in dragon Jackson. class at the 60 Olympics. A lot of people don't know this. I mean, they know he's a sailor and that he's a, a president of honor of, uh, of world sailing and a member of the IOC, which we'll tell you about more in a moment. But here's what happened in 1964. The man who restored the Greek monarchy to a position of respect is dead. King Paul I, who had reigned since 1947, has been succeeded by his son, Constantine, at 23, the youngest reigning monarch. Paul was accorded a warm welcome in the United States when he visited Washington and President Eisenhower. He welcomed Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy to his nation on several occasions, and he delighted to touch on the close relationship between Greece and the United States. The king is dead, long live the king. Sharing the throne will be Princess Anne Marie of Denmark, Constantine's future bride. She is from the Danish branch of the new monarch's family. The oath of office was taken before Archbishop Chrysostomos and cabinet members, including Premier Papandreou, a man who has done so much to bring stability to the Greek government. King Constantine faces parlous times ahead, but he has the best wishes of all free nations. May his new regime be one that brings new meaning and stature 
to a country with a glorious tradition. So on this day in 1961, and of course, Kennedy, JFK, was president, and uh, His Majesty did uh, have some tough times. He had a coup and a counter coup and ultimately fled Greece and, and went to live in the UK where he's been living until he was uh, let, the government recently let him go back and live in his home country, Greece. And he's a, I know him pretty well from IYRU slash ISAF. Terrific guy. He is now the president, has been for years, the co-president of honor along with His Majesty King Harold of Norway. A president of honor of world sailing here he is giving an award at one of the world sailing agms and he's also an honorary member of the ioc very influential member because he's he's not a not a man without a country but in many ways uh you know the people love the royalty and especially gold medalists uh, royals who've won gold medals and moreover his sister is the Queen of Spain, is Queen Sophia, the, the wife of the, the King Emeritus of His Majesty King Juan Carlos, who, of course, is also a sailor, though he's not in the IOC. He says, I'm too busy to get involved in that sort of thing. But this is how well connected our sport is. And that's before you mention Eng Sir Myung, who's the senior vice president of the IOC and Many, many others. Jackie, Jacques Roga, who's a Finn sailor and past, I think, president of the Finn class even, who was the president of the IOC for eight years. So these are cool people, and we're lucky to have them in the sport, including His Majesty King Constantine, who was uh, coronated. What's that? Is that the right word? His coronation. Is coronated a word? Huh? Julia? Probably. I mean, you've got a Harvard uh, grad, and we got a— Coronation. And we've got a bloody— <laughs> Stanford grad, you guys are some, James. Where'd you go to school? Oh, back in Northern Ireland. Okay, he's like he must have gone to a public yeah. school, like the simple school yeah. I went to in Michigan. Yeah. Any anyway, event, these guys, what's that? Nothing. These guys are cool people. We're lucky to have them in the sport. And if you think we're ever going to get kicked out of the sport, despite the cretonicism that is afoot now at World Sailing, don't you know? Come on. Now, his one last thing about Constantine, he is a confidant of Her Majesty. They are, I think he's a godparent, you know, he's probably one of several to either Harry or William. I'm not sure which, because he was quite close to Charles and Diana as well. Okay, that is this day in history. But wait, there's more. This day in history, in 1995, do you know what happened in this day in history in 1995. In fact, it was yesterday in 1995. I mean, that's... An American 25 American years American. ago, San Diego. Sinking of the boat. Sinking of the... Well done. There's... I need one of these. I need a some kind of a bell that when somebody gets the right answer, we go, ding! <laughs> well, well done, James. You got the right answer. Take a look at this. This is one, this is one of the scariest pieces of video I've ever seen and, and one of the most memorable. Now about halfway up, leg number three, the second beat to windward, it's getting fresher, 18 knots gusting 20, and the seas are getting bigger, this is becoming quite a tough test now, and Team New Zealand comfortably in front of one Australia. Now there seems a problem on one Australia. See, the back stay's gone loose and the fore stay. There is definitely a problem aboard One Australia. Their rigging has gone slack. Why? The boat is turning into a banana. There's real problems here. The crew are summoning the chase boat to come alongside. There are real problems. The boat has snapped in two. The structure has given in. One Australia is taking on a lot of water. This is very serious. Well, now the crew have got to move quickly. They could be in serious trouble and they're getting off quickly. They could be in danger if they get caught on that rig. They've got to get off the boat fast. The boat is bending. 
It is going down fast. Look at the three on the foredeck. What on earth are they doing? They've got to get off. There's the Team New Zealand chase boat. And they've gone along to pick up the crew. This is incredible. A Formula One racing yacht is breaking up before our eyes and sinking. This is yachting's answer to the Titanic. Look at it go down. They're panicking on getting the crew, making sure they've got the heads, but look how quickly the boat is being sucked into the Pacific. This uh. is incredible. Now you see it, now you don't. <laughs> In just over a minute from the time the crew started jumping off, the boat has disappeared. In just over 30 seconds from the time the deck was awash, one Australia has been sucked to the bottom of the Pacific. Okay, that's, uh, that's of course, the voice of PJ, Peter Montgomery. Oh, PJ who's, Montgomery. You would have to say, I think, gang, you would all agree, Julie, I think you, we would all agree he's just one of the best Absolutely. commentators ever. And uh, yeah. I, Jen, you're a broadcasting pro. I think that was voiced. I think you watched the video and, and voiced it after the fact, wouldn't you say? Oh, good question. I don't think um, I don't think he was doing that live. I think that's back in the studio after they after it happened. But he, he was he, he was gets more excited than that. Usually. Well, no, he's pretty. In fact, that's one of the good things about him is that he is level headed and and not histrionic and not, you know, making it a bigger deal than than what the picture shows. And of course, the pictures, as you said, Julie, you were watching it, it gave you. I get yeah chills just uh, watching it. Response, exactly. Yeah. It, it, James, I mean, two things about that. I think I think PJ, he was the very first when I had to do the um, trials to do the America's Cup. So uh, 2010 had just happened and Oracle had won on Valentine's Day. And then they had a trials down in Auckland and they brought in some newbies to right. see who could cut it, maybe. Yeah. And we had to sit in a container with Peter Montgomery. And it was like, okay, that is the legend that is the voice of sailing. And essentially I felt like everyone else there had never done it. I had just done the cup with Sailing Anarchy for a website online, but not anything of the point of being hired by the America's Cup and sitting yeah. next to Peter Montgomery and like having a headset on for the first time, you know, and hearing Leon Sefton, who I adore and has been the easiest person to learn from and work with. And yet PJ is such a professional, you know, uh -huh. he had an event that weekend and he was like, if we weren't, doing the broadcast practice, there was no conversation happening with him. Like he was writing notes and saving his voice and drinking tea with honey. And it was um, both extremely exhilarating and horrifyingly uh, scary exactly. at the same time to have to kind of sit like this close to someone and be like, and now that we're done, we can't talk. Yeah, uh, he, he, it's just, he starts and talking and poetry, poetry I comes know, I feel like out he of his maybe mouth. could have made up that the boat is folding like a banana and this is the sports version of Titanic right on the spot. I think those were incredible phrases that he used and somewhere in the, um, him trying to figure out what to say while it was happening is, um, just kind of typical PJ. I think he's really good at it, but cool people. Yeah, it's, it's, Julia. it's the Sydney Hobart that I did with Chris Welsh. The reason I know him is from racing. We had a boat sink and we had to go and be involved in a rescue. And luckily with that, it was, more like 45 minutes, but just to see how fast it can actually happen for oh, yeah. a boat to go underwater. I think it's a, it's a, something that we always have to keep in mind as a reminder of our sport. James, have you, have you been on a big boat that sank? Uh -oh. Can you hear us? There we go. We got you now. James, have you been on a big boat that sank? No, that sank. No. Good. Was he stayed above the water? Okay, well, I mean, I mean, we've had John Sangmeister on the show, who's tragically his OEX sank during the Transpac race this year, or fairly early on in the race. And, you know, they all got off safely. And I mean, it, it's scary stuff. OK, let's get into the segment with you guys. Jen, we've got a couple, three. And I know James wants to get back to work. You are flying tonight, right? To the UK? Uh, I am flying now, yeah, seven, and he's staying for about a week. Oh, you're week. staying because yeah. you're working over at Chris Welsh's place anyway. And uh, in a minute, Jen, you're going to make a pretty in, in, uh, pretty cool announcement about your future, right? <laughs> in a minute. Sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. tell us before we do that, go to this picture, because this is when you really first came on my radar screen. I knew we sort of knew each other, and you were a friend of Meg's, my daughter Meg's. 
and I'm not sure quite when, but tell us about this picture. So this is this is morning light. So I was um, I was involved with the morning light team. I was only there were two females in the team, and then I was the female on board. But also I was a um, skipper candidate. We called it in the training. There were four of us that were voted uh, possibilities to be skipper. And then uh, Jeremy Wilmot, who's there to my left, who's um, kind of an Australian American, I guess you would say. A lot of his family is Australian. His brother Nathan's one. Uh, gold medal, if not maybe two, but Jeremy, we ended up voting as our skipper unanimously. He was he was just the right mix of um, of knowledge and and fortitude and kind of go getterness, and um, it was an incredible opportunity, I think, for everyone involved in the team. That's Steve to my right. Steve actually didn't know how to sail really well. The, the, sorry, Jen. Hang on. Minutes. Slow down, yeah. please. Your your brain. <laughs> you go to Harvard, and your brain works so fast. The gentleman, to, the gentleman yeah. to your right on the left in the photo is Steve. Yeah, Steve didn't end up making the race team, um, but he was one of our alternates. And he uh, was a Baltimore, had learned to sail in the sailing center in Baltimore and was um, one of the youth that kind of, were, there were a couple different levels of experience on the boat. So there were myself and Jeremy and Charlie and Wright and people who came in, as you said already, I was college sailor of the year already at this point in time. I had been on but, the U.S. sailing team. I had been training for the Olympics already. Right. And then there were people like Steve and then Mark Towell, who has gone on to do really well with Charlie in the Volvo. Mark Towell was still yep. in high school. Now, um, now so back was, up. But let me back you up one more step. Tell us again about Morning Light. This is the Disney-sponsored what? Disney-sponsored youth team that they were making a documentary film about for us to do the Transpac race, which was basically Roy Disney's favorite race in the world. I think he had done it somewhere north of 15, maybe it's even 25 times. I should know the answer to that. But he um, wanted to have a youth team do the race and Disney wanted to film it and make a documentary film about it, which was both the team and the film later were called Morning Light. And um, it was an incredible adventure for all of us. You know, I think I still look back on those days. I'm still in touch with people from the team. I I said then, and I kind of think the same now, I think as a dinghy sailor or as someone who's, especially in the U.S. with college sailing, which is um, a huge part of your life and takes up a lot of hours and time, you kind of get to a point where you feel like you know so much about sailing. And then if you haven't been on big, big boats and you haven't been offshore, you maybe think that you know this circle. And then I said, I realized that I knew the beginning of the A's in the dictionary. You know, mm. it was like just a, an entirely, and we had um, Robbie Haynes, who's a gold medalist and was Roy's right-hand man and tactician long time. And we had Stan Still is. also as our main coach. Yeah, and, and Mike Sanderson came in, coached us, and it was just a phenomenal and, experience for and the and entire I th group. I think that film, Morning Light, is on, I don't know if it's on Netflix or if it's on YouTube, but it's it's available. That, that was 20, what was that, 2011? iTunes, I think. So it was 2007. Um, it was... 2007. So maybe it, yeah. yeah, so maybe it came out in um, 2007 and we did the, the race in 2006. And it's, um, I think, available on iTunes. You know, I've seen it so oh, many well, times. Ju Julia's already on it. She's... <laughs> Julia's researching it over there. She's got her fingers working and her pen working. And yeah. But, uh, guys, let's talk about James for a minute. James, S-P-E-S-P-E-Y, Irish laser Olympian who was at the Olympics in 2012 and then qualified for the Olympics in 2016 as well, right, James? Correct, yep. And uh, it, you obviously are one of the top and have were at least one of the top laser sailors in the world. Well, what else about your career, and how did you end up here in the Bay Area with Chris Welsh? Well, after the laser stuff, I decided to go back to school, basically, of sailing and, and get into the big boats. Um, after hearing Jenny's story of morning light and the adventures of what you get up to in those boats, I thought I'd throw my hat into that ring and see how I get on. Where in Ireland did you grow up? Uh, Northern Ireland, Royal Oster Yacht Club and Ballyhoon Yacht Club, my home um, clubs in, in Bangor. And now so you're we sailed with CQS for a while with the yeah. Rambo program. And then last year when we came here for our paper wedding, essentially, um, he met Chris, who I had done 
we won the LA to Tahiti race on Chris's boat Ragtime, which is a classic. I, I saw a picture of that. Actually, I should have grabbed that yeah. and put that in here because I, I, I saw that. And uh, the Tahiti race is coming we, up ag again this got year. A model on the wall just back here. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. That's of Ragtime. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. So I did the LA to Tahiti race um, with Chris and then the Sydney Hobart. We won overall in the LA to Tahiti race, which was fun because we um lost our navigator a week before the race so this was all um the year after morning light so i was still doing offshore racing for a lot and then trying to figure out what my next um olympic steps would be basically and then match racing came into the fold and i um went towards the match racing but at that point in time i was doing a bit of skiff sailing because there was the possibility that the women's skiff would be in the games and um the Tahiti race, we lost our navigator the week before. He ended up hurting his back and needing back surgery. And we just, Chris was like, between us, we can make the decisions that'll get us there. And the rest of the teams that we were racing against had more experienced navigators, you could say. Um, we took some risks, I think, but it was a conversation of how to get through the doldrums the quickest because Tahiti is obviously the other side of the globe and you have to cross them. And for us, we decided to go south early when we knew that the door was open and the window was there and the rest of the fleet decided to go to the next window and ours was essentially taking a couple named storms so we never saw the doldrums we just saw awesome breeze the whole time down cool and um cool we arrived in 14 days what i think should have taken 21 yeah so, well yeah. that the, so the tahiti thought, ray la tahiti race is on again this summer I've done a segment. I've had them on the show, a, a video segment when they were making a presentation at St. Francis. They've asked me actually to go to Tahiti and do some live streaming from down there at the other end, but we'll see. That's what Ju Julia wants to go. Oh, I well, I you was should, on the other side. You go. I, I, I met the 72. Tahiti uh, race? Tahiti race. Yeah, yeah. Well, she, Julia's, as you probably know, Jen, Julia's quite a cruiser. She, in every sense of the word. And you she, bet it. <laughs> she, not, not racing to any place. <laughs> a blue water sailor. But uh, James, anything else from you about your career and what you're up to? But you're going to be here in the Bay Area, it sounds like, because Jen's going to make her new announcement about being here in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. So we're putting the ragtime back together and um, see if we can continue on that story. And um, and then Chris has also got with his partner, Gabriel, the Hedge of the Terror program. So putting in the process of taking that mask down and taking it apart and servicing it and hopefully get that up on doors. Right. And well, we shall look forward to having you around. Uh, are you doing any laser sailing anymore? Or are you, are, are you too old for that now? <laughs> I, I luckily got out just before we became a master and I'm quite keen to get back into it, but Jenny's not keen. She wants to get something else. He will buy a laser before we even move back to San Francisco. He is so eager to be there. A laser just sailed by just now and an Etchells. And I was like, oh, James, is like he can't wait to race in the fleet here. So yeah, he'll be in one soon enough. Don't you worry. Yeah, I'm hoping to get one of Charlie Buckingham's boats. <laughs> Okay, well, great yeah. to have you both on the show. And James, if you can stay terrific, and if you've got to run back to the yard, that's that's okay, uh, if it's okay with everybody else. Yeah, be sure to check yeah. comments because several people have said hello to you. Uh, you know. Oh, really? Uh, that's a good, <laughs> good reminder to make. Uh, Julie always reminds us that for all of you who are watching, is to, it's good to go back and look at the comments because people are adding comments as, as we come and go. That is people coming on, watching it live, and then having to leave. And also, we leave commenting on, uh, we leave commenting on for the the replays. So if you want to watch it in replay, and there's the next slide. So Jenny, you can get your talk. Tell us about that. If you want to comment rather in replay, we leave that on. A lot of live streams don't do that, but most of our, in fact, all of our people, with with only one or two exceptions, we had a problem with people putting croutonic comments on after the fact and, and we it, watch them pretty and good. if you do julia will get you i will because she goes back and checks it <laughs> she's sitting up there watching the tv and watching it on her computer up in her apartment here at the beach street yacht club okay james thank you carrying on with jen ciao man you're gonna stay or you gotta go he's going <laughs> he's gotta roll i think he's he's forgotten about the other project which is um pentarius uh um uh, chris has got like a submarine project that is Oh, yeah. The, the boat the, is based in Japan right now. Yeah, it's the old PlayStation, which became Cheyenne, which was Steve Fawcett's um, right. project, both the 
both the catamaran that is the mothership now for the submarine and the submarines. And James was just in Japan before all of coronavirus. So back in December, kind of winterizing the boat. And I think in a couple weeks, if not maybe in the next couple of months, when it's all clear, they will go back and um, take on that project again. And the submarine, that like was a very, through. I think that was our most second most popular show, yeah, wasn't it, was. it, Julia? Yeah, it was. Yeah. With Chris Welsh and talking about the oh, submarine. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, well, Jan, Jan like you've also had a, besides a, a terrific sailing career, you've also been a bit of an entrepreneur, but also a, a lot of doing a lot of commentary, a lot of broadcasting. What's what's this picture from? Yeah, yeah. This is me and Louie Habib. So I did the Star Sailors League for a number of years until I went to the NBA. Um, of course, I've done the last kind of every America's Cup since 2010 um, with the Dogzilla match. I did the Volvo Ocean Race 2014-2015 um, um, and then followed that with the next kind of America's Cup World Series and the next America's Cup. Yeah, that's the Volvo. So that's their uh, headquarters. It's like NASA headquarters. And I think um, probably you guys have seen after me, they, they did the same thing the following year. But this was the first year that we did this sort of daily show hosted uh, live, mostly maybe as live if we had... Um, um, problems with boats in the middle of the ocean and we weren't be able to get the satellite phone calls that we wanted. But ideally, the show was there to be able to call the boats live, really check in, have an audience every day that was that was both engaged with the race and able to ask questions while we were there and, and just really give an update. And I think it was a very cool addition to the race. I think they did with Niall Mayant this time, they did a great job the next race as well. The, the, and um, the, just such a cool thing to be a part of, yeah. This is at the Volvo what is what was the VOR and is now TOR, the Ocean Race, at their headquarters in Alicante, where they have that full-on broadcast center, as well as the, 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 well, it's the whole race headquarters. And the race starts there, but it doesn't necessarily finish there, as we know. You don't want to comment on that? I've lost Julie? Sorry, I lost you for a second. Okay. I heard you say the race starts there. And then well, the race starts the there, but it but the ocean race won't necessarily finish there, or so we hear. Yeah, I heard a lot of different things about the next ocean race. I don't know. I don't know how to necessarily uh, say what will or won't happen with the race. But I think I loved being in Alicante. I thought that the the family that is the ocean race family now and the Volvo Ocean Race family then is a spectacular group of people to be a part of both in, in the event and in the teams. And I yeah, think it, it's a, um, been a good general, team. Wish it the best. Been a good team. Of course, those of you who don't know Spain very well, Alicante is on the Mediterranean, a couple hours, two and a half hours drive south of Valencia, depending upon how fast you drive. But it's a, it's a nice town, a lot, of, a lot of Northern Europeans, Brits, Danes, Irish, in fact, hanging out in Alicante, where the Ocean Race headquarters are. One hears that there are not very many boats being built of the Amoca 60 class for this next one, which is, of course, one of two classes that have been announced. But we need not get into that now. Let's talk about what you're getting into, which is this. Talk about being an entrepreneur. Tell us a little bit about what this is all about. Uh, this is from this is from my um, company, Borrow Boat. So we had a, a beautiful um, week long marketing shoot last year in um, in Greece in Lefkadas in the Ionian Islands. So it was James's first time to go cruising actually at all. He doesn't even he didn't understand what cruising was about. He was like, "What do we do? I, we're not <laughs> racing. This is confusing." I was like, "Every time you feel confused, you just grab a beer. <laughs> like that's that's your job." <laughs> so great. Um, we had him. Yeah, it was good. We had him. He's got um uh, the international license, um, offshore license for for captains. I'm blanking on the name offshore certificate, but so he was the captain of one of the boats. Our CEO also has one and so does our CEO. So um, he enjoyed, he'd never been on a catamaran, I don't think necessarily before. And we were just on a 50 foot catamaran and then on that's a monohull there, like a 40 foot monohull. And we had an awesome week. I was uh, worked to the bone because it was actually combining my old job with my new job. It was a lot of filming, a lot of um, photos and videos and kind of organizing the crew that we had hired for that and then organizing mostly we just brought our team members as our model so that was myself and our head of experiences there um and then we had our ceo and his his family so he's got four kids and his wife's a doctor and 
we had a great week. It was a lot of work, but it brought some um, gorgeous photos afterwards. And James, maybe, I don't know if he's if he's changed to be a lifelong cruiser. He definitely wants to be racing all the time that we're on a boat. That's that's the way I am. I, I do not suffer cruising very well. And again, I, I, like James, grew up as a small boat sailor. But, you know, as you get older, he he's, he's young. What is he, 32 or 3? How old is he? He's 36. Oh, 36. Yeah. He's old. My my goodness, Julia. <laughs> James is all of 36. Good heavens. <laughs> but uh, he'll relax and start to enjoy cruising more as he gets, I'm sure, as he matures, as he gets a little older. And you'll be a good influence. But tell us, this is this World Sailing Trust has done a deal with Borrow, Borrow a Boat. And you have been the CMO for Borrow a Boat. And that's about to change. Yeah, so, but tell us about the tie-up with D. Kafari and the World Sailing Trust, which sounds to me like a good deal. Yeah, I forged this partnership. I was really uh, happy to do this and, and proud of it. I think, in general, I think people in the sport and the companies of our sport should be paying attention, much like the ocean race is, about um, what we can do to be better for our oceans. So this partnership this year is about that, is about um, essentially developing sustainability guidance for both boat owners and boat charterers. And um, that's what we'll be developing with the World Sailing Trust over the coming months, hopefully in time for summer. Um, so it'll be an online resource, a tool and a quiz and uh, give you the awareness and the understanding of how you are doing currently as either a boat owner or a boat charterer. And then kind of give you steps for what you can do better in the future to, um, to be better to the environment. So. There's really simple things from uh, having a water maker on board and not using the massive amounts of water bottles or, um, I mean, often when you go to the Caribbean, you forget that things are very different there or even in the med that it's just people aren't quite as conscious yet as they maybe could be. And um, what you can do from home before even leaving for a trip to be better about it or just in general as a boat owner, what you can do to get your boat set up to be to be much more friendly. Well, I think this is one of the good things that World Sailing is doing. And this World Sailing Trust, which, as you know, is is led by D. Kafari, and they've done a, a big push on, on understanding how to help get women more involved in the sport and other, you know, some, some minorities. I mean, women aren't necessarily a minority, but there's a minority in the sport still today, which is nice to see progress, but we've got, we make a lot more progress. Yeah, I mean, the World Sailing Trust, their three main tenets are accessibility to the sport of sailing, the sustainability of the oceans, and a youth pathway. So in general, I think those are amazing things. I think that the ability that they have to focus on women with what they did last year with their um, work that was inspired and helped by Andrew Pindar, um, to talk about what it's like to be a female in the sport right now and what opportunities are or particularly maybe aren't there, I think there is still a huge lack of awareness about that. And the ability to bring awareness is kind of the first step to then bring change. And I think in reality, there's a long way to go to make the sport uh, gender equal or gender neutral. I think the Olympics is doing a really good job of trying to get there in terms of at least the numbers of the games. But I think um, any little steps that can be made in that in that vein, yeah. And for, for anything, it's not just for females, it is a lack of diversity in general for the sport as well. So I think I think they've got some really good tenants. I think they're doing some really good things. And I think um, we should look for more good work from the World Sailing Trust itself. Have you faced adversity? Have you felt like you, as a female, felt like you've been discriminated against in our sport? Have you missed opportunities? Because you're, And I'm not talking about strength or per se, because obviously there are some positions that you're going to have, you know, somebody my size, I'm too big or somebody, I'm not strong enough for the position. You may not be strong enough, but have, have your access to the sport, have your ability to train and excel in the sport, compete in the sport? Has it been affected by your being, by your gender? Massively. Yeah. I mean, I think if I wasn't female, I would be a professional sailor. And I'm female, so, so same size, same strength, <laughs> same weight, irrespective. I think a lot of that factors in. I mean, I think I think the reality is there are small males who are making it in the sport. My um, longtime partner before James, Mark Ivy, is about my same size and had a lot more opportunities via the networking that sailing has. And I think, in general, whether or not it's a strength thing or not, the 
opportunities aren't there for females. So if you look at the last Volvo and you look at the number of females who were racing, uh, the last two Volvos even, who were racing an SCA, and then the next Volvo, they kind of come out of it. And there are some really strong females that are involved in those Volvo teams, and they don't have the options that the males do afterwards. And I think if you look at right now in professional sport, the America's Cup, and then unfortunately CLGP, there was one female last year. She's not involved this year. I think the reality is the Volvo had to institute rules that kind of forced women on board. And originally the conversation had about that was that females would hate to be forced on board and no one would want to take roles where they felt really like they were there to make the numbers up because of the rule. And yet without those, there wouldn't have been females maybe in the last race at all. And if you look at someone like Caroline Brower, who was such a talented athlete, for her to not be involved uh, in the sport in in a way, just because essentially it's still an, an old man's sport or, or a boys club or a, yeah, I think, I think it's um, not even a question. I think it's 1000% affected by by our um, gender at the moment still. Interesting. And, and we, you know, we have this question come up any, not just when we have, uh, have a female guest, but anytime we we discuss a lot and Julie and I discuss it a lot because she is, I don't know how much you know about Julia's background, Jen, but she is a, she, she has been one of these women who was the first this and that in her company. She was the first, oh, well, Julie, you can tell me better than I. Well, I, I've had a, a whole string of first forever. In, in a man's world. In a man's world. So, uh, you know. It, but how do you feel about having quotas, in effect, for X many females in this position or not? I'm not a quota fan. Um, I, I, I remain hopeful that 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 doesn't uh, uh, is the only way in. And people who are the quota people are are reminded of that in companies. Well, uh, yeah, and and, yeah. and on board, you wouldn't be here if you weren't a woman. Mm. Um, I've never had any of that, fortunately. But but Jen, on the other hand, that that worked out pretty well in the Volvo. I think there was a lot of opposition to the the man mandatory. I thought that was actually a pretty good rule when they said, "Well, you can have uh, if you have one woman, you can have X many people. If you have two women, you can have X many people on the boat, right?" For the, the and you ha- you essentially got more pairs of hands. And I think at the end of the race, tell me if I'm wrong. You were covering it uh, as a broadcaster, as a commentator. Both uh, it was 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 the the positive spin or the positive PR that came out of that was it genuine or were people saying well you know we just got to say that to be to to go along with the party line? Um, two things. I wasn't actually covering that race. I covered the previous race during that one. I was in the NBA. Okay, but, but you know everybody. There were a number you. of yeah. I think there were a number of. I do think it was a net positive. I think in general the amount of press about females on board, about how the racing was about forget that it's a female, just the fact that they were being interviewed and they were on board and they were racing around the world. You then see a face that is a female being interviewed. Um, I think in those respects, the more that we can put female athletes in front of audiences showing that they're doing the job just as well, I think that's really good. I do think that maybe some of the teams still weren't as good about accepting them as equals on board. And they were treating them like Julia was saying that they were a bit marginalizing the females on board. And some of the contracts might not have been the same contract if that person had been a male instead of a female there to make up the numbers. So I think there are still steps needed to change the mind and the mentality. And a lot of that is still the experience. So sure, if females haven't been given the experience offshore in the last 10 years, then it is hard to to, um, give them the respect that maybe another sailor would be if they had been doing the Volvo for the last 10 years. So it's just going to take more races with more girls on board, more boats to then feel like that's the person you want to hire rather than someone else who's done the race a number of times. And I think it, it, the Amaka 60s kind of opened the door a little bit more, but yeah, go ahead. In, in the meantime, should we have rules like the VOR rule of last time for the America's Cup for Sail GP, where there is a requirement that there be X many women on board each crew? I mean, I think we thought it would be a hindrance with the Volvo and it worked out better than not having the rule. And so, yeah, I think if SailGP could have a rule that says each boat needs a female, then each boat needs a female. And then there would at least be, you know, five, six, seven, however many, they're hoping for 10 teams next year. There would be that many more female professional sailors being seen by audiences who watch racing. 
And, you know, I'm sure at some point Russell will hear this from other people or has already heard it and they've made decisions not to go that way. But I don't think it is a bad thing to, yeah, I think it's, I think it's tough that quotas are the necessary part to get there right now. But I think probably when the Olympics started forcing the numbers more towards females, there were people upset about it. And yet the females would never have gotten in the door of the Olympics nearly as easily without that. And now we look at Olympic sailors, both male and female, and we think, we don't think any less of the females who are racing in the Olympics right now, but the opportunities they have thereafter aren't necessarily as easy for them to then make a living and become an athlete in a professional sense outside of the Olympic Games. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, and uh, here's a quote from a Fosey. Clark Chapin says, I recall Elizabeth Warren's comment yesterday regarding sexism, something like, it's a hard question. If I say yes, people call me a whiner. If I say no, a bazillion woman will say, what planet are you living on? Yeah. Uh, t tell everybody who Elizabeth Warren is. Uh, she was a candidate for a Democratic candidate for president who just uh, stepped down. Yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Uh, Jen, how about mixed gender teams? We know that the NACRA team, the NACRA teams for 2016, uh, that seemed to be a success. A lot of us sail mixed gender teams in all, in our day to day, year to year sailing. But how the pre there are pressures, there's sociological and other psychological pressures of mixed gender teams. Should we be, should forty percent of our Olympic program be mixed gender, forced by the world sailing, or should we have an equal or nearly equal number of women's medals or m women's slots in the Olympics and men? What, what's the, what's the right balance there? And why is one or the other preferred? I mean, I think when you ask any female, they much prefer mixed gender racing. Mm. I think in the last Volvo, I think you heard a couple of the skippers make really good comments after finishing the race about having had females on board and how the team actually became more professional for having females on board, that it wasn't just like a boys locker room sailing around the world anymore and that they were also able to learn from them. So I think there's a number of things that having diverse teams do. We know that in general in life and business. Um, that they always perform better. And I think diversity in, in sexes is better. And I think um, particularly I noticed it in, in college sailing, I felt like I was being uh, relegated sometimes to women's racing because I was female and I would have much preferred to be able to co-ed race every weekend against the best. And instead being winning the women's racing and, and no offense to the female racing necessarily, but being a female college of the year, which I was as a sophomore and I was a runner up my freshman year, to me wouldn't have nearly had the same shine on it as getting to race co-ed regattas every single weekend and being actually racing against the best, not just relegated to a corner. So I think reality is I would be a way bigger fan of the Olympics all being co-ed, not necessarily being um, any male or any female and just deal with the weights and deal with the sizes as is. Julia, before we leave this topic, are there any, I haven't been, because there's it's so much going on. on the, is there any, any, are there any questions or comments related to this that we should get to before we leave this topic? Um, a lot of people, we got a ton of people on here watching, uh, yeah, yeah. as you can imagine, <laughs> Jen, which is, which is good. I'm not too much. <laughs> you know, they haven't, they, I'm, I'm sure some people tuned in to see what rant I would have today about Mr. Crutonic Chaotic the befuddled, beleaguered president. Yeah. But um, there, are, there are no burning questions. But lots, no burning. Some, no, some, but be sure to read the comments and the hellos. Well, I think, no surprise, I think Jen's articulated that whole Absol topic very well. Absolutely. Well done. Okay. Uh, Jen, let's move on to this new exciting uh, topic that you've got because you're about to start a new chapter and you just signed the contract this morning, if I understand well. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking about this a second ago about females after the Olympics and, and how hard it is for them. And I think in general, this is a thing that after the Olympics, what you do as a person and how you are able to make money um, is difficult. And so Airbnb, which is um, Bay Area based, as everyone knows, is uh, has, has announced, I think, 10 years of sponsorship of the next Olympics, of which a part of it is making Olympic experiences. So yeah, you picked a good... Um, article here, Tom, but this is about um, trying to engage Olympic athletes to um, to to put up experiences as hosts on the site. I'm sure you guys know that 
Airbnb does hosting for houses. And then also that there's the segment called experiences and you can do things like cooking class or dancing class, or um, we took a pizza class in Italy, but they are now gonna have Olympic experiences as well. And so people can pay money to go on an experience with an Olympic athlete. And it can be sort of anything from a coffee chat to talk about strategy or nerves or team dynamics or nutrition or working out with an Olympian on shore or for sailors, it can be all the way to going on the water and going sailing with someone or coaching them or um, even just taking a rib around and looking at tide or um, it's a very cool tie up, I think, between the IOC and the America's Cup. And it's it's hopefully there to help Olympians who are currently training and who maybe have just finished the games um, be able to make a sustaining livelihood, but also to allow people who aren't Olympians to, to get involved and to meet Olympians and to do something that's really, really cool and near where they are or in the sport that they're interested in, you know, okay, for me, so, so help, I know sailing super well. Help, but I could do hang on, slow down again. You, you gotta say your brain is wired. You like Larry Ellison, your brain is wired at a megahertz or two faster than most people. So as I understand, and this was all new to me when, since we talked about it in the bar at St. Francis, what a week or so ago, Airbnb has become a future Olympic sponsor. Is it for this Olympics 2020 or is it starting after 2020? Starting this Olympics. So part of the sponsorship as well is um, having housing for the Olympics. So for Tokyo, and again, you started the show with coronavirus as a big question mark. So I think reality is there is a big question mark around this Olympics in general. Yeah, but, okay, it's forget uh, about coronavirus China, but, and, and Tokyo, um, but Airbnb is spending 50 million a year, which is, you know, not that's that's a typical Olympic sponsorship for a 10-year tie-up. It's a long deal. Usually they're 5, sometimes a little longer, but a 10-year tie-up. 500 mil for Airbnb to be the official offsite housing sponsor, I guess. Is that right? What's the yeah, it's a good question. I because because mine is going to be a bit more on the experiences side. I haven't actually asked about what the official title is for them in the housing, but a lot of it is to do with providing housing during the during the Olympics. So whether it's provided housing for say the broadcast team like myself, I mean I'm actually already involved in this upcoming Olympics as a as a um, commentator. So they were telling us they weren't sure where the com commentary would be from, whether it would maybe be from either Madrid or London or Tokyo. And some of that was because they knew that there weren't necessarily enough hotel rooms in Tokyo for all of the broadcast teams for all of the sports. Now, well, the, the commentary um, might be remote in a sound studio somewhere like Sail GP is doing it with the commentators in a in the TV studios in London, even though the exactly, events in Sydney yeah. or San Francisco. But what you just signed a contract with them this morning with Airbnb to do what? So I'm helping them with the experiences side of it. So both the experiences for sailing and all other sports and um, seeing how we can run the program and, and hopefully make it successful through to the future. So I think they're looking for, I mean, if you're a sailor Olympian out there, send me a Facebook message. I'll send you a lot more details and information on it. But um, yeah, just really getting that off the ground and running and then uh, launching it, I think, in the next couple months. I won't get a and, deadline date on that. And yeah. this is not just sailoring, sailing Olympians. This is across awesome. the board. So Airbnb is part of this. I don't have to go rent an Airbnb for to, to get uh, to get involved in this experience i could presumably will be able to contact your uh, operation your office and say hey i want to sp spend some money to have an, an olympic experience with an olympian and it might be in hey let me go watch you train when you're some sport that i happen to like maybe archery or track and field or something or i want to go out and just just have you tell us what it's about in life. Is that right? Is, is this is a chance to cozy up with, with current Olympic athletes and learn about their sport, learn about their lives, learn about the, the psychology and the, the sports competition. Is it, if I got that exactly, right? Yeah. Current and current and past. Oh gosh, sorry guys. That's me hitting my own table, current and past Olympians as well. So yeah, there will be, um, I think there's some big names who've just signed up to the platform recently who will be um, putting themselves on as experiences. So it is, yeah, it could be everything from going running with the runner to, uh, as we said, going sailing to literally just hearing the life story of someone that you've always been a big fan of and maybe no one else knows about, but they are Olympian from your town or from your home club or something like that. So, and the Olympians, and be, go ahead. 
it will just be live on Airbnb once they're launched. So Airbnb has either homes, experiences, or I think they've just launched adventures as well. So you'll be able to click in experiences, click in Olympic and search wherever you're searching for, whatever city or whatever sport. I mean, here's the graphic that I have seen on the website. Share your passion mm -hmm. with the world, do what you love and get paid for it with Airbnb experiences, this is a pitch to Olympic athletes apply now to be part of this Airbnb experiences. So you got to sign up athletes to the program. Obviously mm -hmm. you're going to have to vet them and be sure they're not, you know, they're articulate and thoughtful and helpful. Right. Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. And also, uh, Olympians or elite athletes. Exactly. So, so that's bringing you back to the Bay area. You're moving back here longer term. So I'll be based in London, which is on the same time zone as the IOC for the next couple of months, um, possibly through the Tokyo games or possibly through just before the Tokyo games. But yeah, ultimately it's, um, based here in San Francisco. Cool. So, well, we'll look forward to having you back here in the Bay area. Anything, congratulations. It sounds terrific. Yes, Don't it, you think Julia? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it brings, brings out it other things about what else could that, that do yeah but you grew up in houston right in houston texas and are you still a member of houston yacht club or lakewood or one of the clubs down there houston yacht club, call that yeah, exactly. call that home and you're a member here of saint francis where mm -hmm. where julie is a senior serious person i'm just a social i'm just <laughs> oh, a, you know i'm just a social member of course already. you are yeah. <laughs> well it'll be it'll be great to have you back anything else anything to add no, I mean, I think the, the big question mark in the world and in the uh, travel industry and in the Olympic industry is about coronavirus and what what's going to happen there. I mean, unfortunately for James and I, we have our paper wedding certificate from San Francisco, but we were meant to have our celebration in a month in Italy. And it looks like we will have to at least postpone that. I think the America's Cup World Series in Cagliari. I don't know, Tom, you know how to say it. Cagliari. Colliery. Colliery, yeah. three syllables. Um, so so, yeah, I'm, so I've been instructed by all my Italian friends. <laughs> Good, okay, yeah. But I think that's that's a big question mark. And the, the games itself, what will happen there, whether it will be postponed or whether uh, hopefully the heat of summer does actually kill this flu like it kills all other flus. I don't know. I just think I think we're all in a big, um, we're all in a big, vague world right now and i'm yeah getting on a flight to go back to london tonight but you know there is the conversation of should i be going to an airport or is it better to work from home and i think i think the reality is it's um it's going to be a tricky world for the next couple of weeks if not maybe the next couple of months <laughs> yes i went to exactly. safeway last saturday that's safeway for those of you not here in california is a big uh, grocery store chain and safeway when i went last saturday night jen the place was that shell rice, uh, pasta, this this sort of stuff? Uh, forget about thermometers and masks, and you know it was all gone. The shelves were empty. It looked like stores in Spain after the truckers had gone on strike when we lived in Spain all those years, and it was frankly pretty unnerving. And then I went last night late, and basically this is democracy in action capitalism in action but the store was packed with water because apparently people are buying water i guess julie you said because people are afraid that if the employees stop going to the hetch hetchy <laughs> reservoir or san francisco water services we might not have water coming out of the tap is that what you think people are worried about I, i'm not worried about that you're not no yeah but you got a lot of water down in the garage yeah but that's when when the water stops for some for reason. the earthquake yeah the next earthquake yeah but jen i uh, seriously i went over there and the they had put these cardboard pallets of water all down the middle of of the big bigger the wider aisles and there was more clorox stuff on top of one a couple of the, the of the shelves on a couple of the aisles and there was stuff all over the place that apparently rice and pasta and peanut butter <laughs> all the shelves were huge full. cans of, of yeah. soup and tuna fish all this canned goods so people you know are able to stock up regardless of what happens and i'm sorry i i hope you take some of this stuff on the plane because you know what i'm hearing and reading is anyone who is flying around is that a if you get it it's in your young and fit like you are it's probably not going to be a deal if if we get it you know julia's 80 and i'm almost 70 we get it. We probably would be okay because we don't have any cardiopulmonary problems that we know of, knock on, you know, wood. But 
apparently the germs are on the are, are con are you know they hang around on surfaces, on surfaces yeah, and week. everyone yeah. is saying whatever you do wash, wash your, your hands. hands and wipe down the surfaces before you hang out in your seat and it feel you feel a little croutonic i think doing that yeah but you know i think that's the safe thing to do right yeah i mean the other things we've read is uh you don't need to wear masks because they don't help you except right? that wearing masks actually helps you not touch your mouth and your nose all the time so we apparently touch our mouth and our nose a lot more than we're aware of and i don't actually own a mask and i won't be wearing one in the airport but it isn't something that you should be judging that if someone is wearing a mask they must have it it is just another precautionary measure but yeah otherwise well, it, it stops you from spreading droplets seconds. to other people the, the surgical surgeon's mask that's why surgeons wear masks so they don't infect the patient they're operating on it's not because they're worried necessarily about getting sick from the patient if they're worried about that they got the plastic shield screen all that other stuff well fly safe we hope you have a, a a good trip back and you'll be back and forth no doubt to the bay area and whatever you if you do end up back here with airbnb permanently we'll be delighted to have you here great thanks tom thanks jen again. anything thanks, else julie anything else for jen only that's very lovely to have you on and thanks for your well-spoken opinions and experience <laughs> terrific Jen, thank you very much. Jenny Tullock. Ciao. See you. Jenny Jenny Tullock, who was, uh, in fact, speaking of coronavirus, we considered, we were originally, in fact, scheduled to have Jen over here in the studio, sitting over there where we normally, where the plant is right now, putting people in the hot seat, as we love to do, not to grill them by any means, but love to have in-studio guests. In some ways, it's easier than Skype. But we thought, just to be a good uh, example, set a good example for everybody. We should just say, Jen, stay over there on the other side of the bay because she's got to fly tonight anyway. And rather than coming over here and then going back and then let's just, you know, keep her, not get any germs from her and we don't give her any germs and we'll just hunker down here at the Beach Street Yacht Club. Right, Julie? Because we have laid on some supplies now. Uh, yes, we could we exist here for a, for, month. for a month. Is that all? Yeah. Because we'd run out of vodka or tequila. Vodka and tequila, yes. <laughs> well, that's that's and coffee. The other thing is coffee. We can't run out of coffee. That's exactly right. Okay, it doesn't look like the supplies are going to be an issue. However, I have talked to several of you, and I I keep posting it on my own Facebook page as we learn more about what's going on. Next Tuesday, I think we're going to have a bit of a coronavirus con conclave, conclave, conclave. Yeah, I think I think we're going to have somebody on the one end of the spectrum, uh, and I'm trying to get Jean-Pierre Keekins up in Montreal, who's I said at the top of the show, is taking his kid out of school, and uh, maybe his kids, and homeschooling them. And they've laid in rice and for the big – I was talking to him yesterday on the phone while I was out running around <laughs> stocking up. And, and I, you know, we're kind of middle of the road. We just want to be able to – you know, I don't have to commute to work. I can walk here into the studio and do the show. And is not going over to the yacht. But the Yacht Club, for example, St. Francis sent a, a notice out to all their members last night saying no more buffets. They've cut any any of the buffets, including Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, only a la carte food. So you, presumably they don't want people sneezing on the food. And they're taking some other – they're putting the Perel, the hand wash around the, the club, and they're more, you know, uh, Kleenexes and so on. So, you know, it's people are doing – Middle of the road, wise, prudent things, don't you think? Uh, it just dawns on me we didn't answer the the question of the day, and there were uh, poll, and there weren't very many comments. There weren't, but uh, of half, ev um, half of everybody. Said, as to the there are two questions, as to the question of whether he will or whether he should resign. Three quarters of people say yes, one quarter no, and. As to whether he will resign. And everybody said no. <laughs> okay. Um, but the person who said uh, he shouldn't resign now is that, the, like, why bother because the election's close and just let it ride? The problem is that the, the place is, has got zero credibility now. He really ought to step down now. Hashtag Kim resign now, exclamation. He really should. And let Gary or Mr. Perry or any of the other VPs, and I'm sure everybody would gather around and, and pitch in and get the place re, 
re-energized and get through this because they got some tough decisions to make. Are they going to cancel this Geno Regatta in Italy? Are they going to cancel the Enoshima pre-Olympic regatta? Are they what what happens if the Olympics get postponed? How are they going to finance the place if they don't get television money from the Olympics? And they they will share in this insurance pool, but they're not going to get the normal if if the Olympics are postponed or canceled, they're not going to get the normal fifteen million dollar post Olympics influx infusion of funds that they normally get. So okay, we'll see. Let's get on with the America's Cup. Uh, the question again relates to Colliery and Portsmouth. Everybody wondering whether those regattas will happen. And uh, by all accounts, they are pushing forward. At least that's the party line. And we can show you this very brief video from Singapore. We told you that ETNZ's boat, Te Ahe, the, the, uh, the, the dolphin, has, was shipped up to Singapore and then had to be transshipped. For, you know, meaning moved from one ship to another there in Singapore, and this crane achieved that. I'll run that again. It's all of, I think, six seconds. So the boat, even without foils, appears to be flying and moves over to another ship, and whether it's still in Singapore or whether it's on en route now to Sardinia, I don't know. And ETNZ have not said, other than I've asked, but other than maybe Richard Gladwell knows, but it, it's it's in Singapore, and whether it has left, headed for Sardinia, I don't know. Uh, this article, this this gentleman, you all know this is Dean Barker, in an article in the New Zealand Herald yesterday, Dino was quoted, well, the headline for the article was, World Series Coronavirus Cancellation Call Must Be Made Soon, American Magic skipper Dean Barker says. And also in that article, Dean said, Quote, Collier, oh, not quite yet, quote, Colliery is, quote, a risky proposition, unquote. I, I, ran, I have run that article on my Facebook page if you want to read it. And, uh, you know, I think it, uh, some of you disagreed, but I think it was simply saying, hey, guys, you know, when are you going to make this decision? And it was in his hometown paper. Remember, he's a Kiwi as the skipper, the helm for, for Terry Hutchinson and New York Yacht Club's American Magic. So I think uh, he was just putting a little pressure on the Kiwis to do something because New York, I'm sure, I, you know, I haven't been told this in so few words, but I'm sure that New York's American Magic would rather not have to ship their boat to Cagliari. They'd rather stay in Pensacola and keep training while the Kiwis are interrupted uh, with their boat. At least they have that training boat, the Hawk, which was very smart of them to build that boat, as I've been saying all along. The problem is not going to these regattas, and it's not just Colliery. It's also the one that's scheduled after Colliery up in, in early June up in Portsmouth at Ben Ainsley's home port. The problem is if you go, what happens if you can't get back into your home country? What happens if the U.S. says, sorry, we're not letting anyone from Italy in here, or at a minimum, if you come back from Italy, you have to sit in self-quarantine or maybe governmental sponsored <laughs> offered quarantine for a couple of weeks. That's a, not, that's not going to be helpful to your America's Cup campaign. So there's a lot of reluctance to go to these regattas. And Colliery itself, it, it, Sardinia originally had none of these coronavirus cases. And then suddenly they had a case and then it quadrupled. And then I think it's it's gone up again. I haven't looked at it today, but we'll see. I mean, it'd be nice. You know, it's not like our sports has a stadium full of people. But it's going to be tough. We'll see what happens. Here's some bre here not breaking news. This is a scoop. Nobody has announced this yet. But we will tell you that Laurent Esquier, who has been the CEO of COR36, has stepped down. He's our longtime friend. He's been involved in more America's Cups than either even Gary Jobson and myself. He goes back and, and, and Bruno Trouble. He goes back to the early 70s where he was with the French teams. Laurent, a, a gentleman of the old school and new, uh, he has been involved in the Cup as a sailor, as a team manager, as an administrator. He has been the CEO for Patrizio Bertelli, the Italians, of the Challenge of Record Function, COR 36, since almost the get-go. He is no longer in that role. We hear reliably that they will soon announce that Matteo Plazzi, who's another longtime friend, 
Italian gentleman who's been with the various Italian America's Cup teams since forever. He is the new CEO. We can also tell you that Mirko Groschner, who our friend from Germany, whom you know well, Julia, yes. uh, is no longer the CMO, the, uh, the chief marketing or commercial director. He has also left the COR 36. And that's all for the product cup, but they're not only running the product cup, which is for the challenger selection series, but they're also running, they're sponsoring the America's cup itself and running a lot of these events. Now as, as to Mateo's CV curriculum Vitae, Palazzi's first foray into the America's cup was with Azura in the 87 LVC. In addition to competing in the America's cup, Mateo has also raced around the world as a crew member aboard Winston in the 93-94 Whitbread race. That was Dennis's team. Platzi was part of the Luna Rosa Challenge team that won the 2000 LVC against Julia, 2000? The famous... The uh, famous... Uh, uh, America. America won. I, yeah. Paul Kayard, St. Paul Francis Kayard. Yacht Club. I right. was with that team as well. And they, it was... A, it was our, most people say that was the best America's Cup series ever. It was the finals of the LVC. And it was went to the full seven or went to full 13 races first to win seven. It was a terrific event in Auckland. So Matteo was a part of that Italian team that won. And then he remained with Luna Rosa for the 2003 and then the 07 LBC. And then he joined uh, Oracle Racing as navigator on USA 17 on the, the big try when it won the 2010 America's Cup. So that boat over there in that picture behind Julia, Mateo was our navigator. He was on that boat and did a terrific job. So I did that campaign with him, got to know him well. Fine gentleman, terrific guy. And he has heretofore been the technical director for Laurent and for the Challenger record, but now he assumes the role. One hears, hadn't been announced yet, but I'm reliably informed he becomes the CEO. Of COR. So a bit of a, a change there in the leadership for the challenge of record. The power behind the throne, of course, is the, the two leaders, are the two leaders of Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli, Max Serena, who's the team manager, and of course, the team principal, Patrizio Bertelli. Mr. Bertelli is on his sixth America's Cup, which now makes him the leader in terms of number of challenges, the previous leader, Julia, you remember, was? Sir Thomas Lipton. Sir Thomas Lipton. Jen's still standing. Jen, do you want to make any comments on any of this? We'll put you in the hot seat. I think there's, yeah, there's shakeups a lot in the America's Cup. I think you can always wonder what's happening behind the scenes, but uh, reality is I think Max is a strong leader and they'll, they'll have a good challenge it's going to be interesting to see those boats go sailing i'm really looking forward to it and kind of scared for it a little bit as well any chance you'll be doing ac commentary um not at the moment i've had conversations with them about it but i uh no not at the moment okay well we'll see what happens jen thank you I'm sorry i saw you were there still in front of yeah. your <laughs> skype camera i thought we'd drag you back in thank you yeah no worries. and that is again jen tollick who is the esteemed Sailor, uh, businesswoman, entrepreneur, commentator, and longtime friend. Thanks for coming back on. Okay, so as we were saying, that is Patrizio Bertelli on the right, who is the team principal, and he's the one who's calling the shots. In fact, everybody knows he's a not only a longtime America's Cup hand by now, but he, he as he does apparently with Prada, as Larry Ellison likes to do with Oracle, one hears. You know, they're involved in the details of the operation, sometimes to the frustration. Am I putting this delicately? No. Sometimes to the frustration of the people who work for them. Okay, enough of all that. Let's go back. Stop there. We haven't done any comments, really, Julia. Let's stop there and go have a, a look because there's so many people on here and still on here. Yeah. You want to take any comments? Well, uh, Welcome uh, anybody in particular? Uh, Alex Saldana. Uh, down in Brazil. Uh, Brazil it says uh, has, uh, many comments, but he says hello to uh, hi Jenny, and then says who is the boss of the ho of the house? What do you think that means between Jenny, between Jenny and 
James? Or, or, or. <laughs> Jenny? <laughs> um, Alex is a great guy. He's a, a, a laser sailor and coach. He coached Robert Scheidt for a number of years. He's from Brazil. And we, um, I don't think we stayed with him when I was training in Brazil for the um, 2016 Olympics, but definitely spent a lot of time with him. But um, I'm sure that's a joke about um, myself and James, but unclear is the boss. It just depends on what we're talking about. If it's about how to how to actually rig a boat and kind of the engineering and the electronics, then James for sure wins. I, I'm not, I was a match racer. You didn't even have to own a boat for a number of years. And then if it's about kind of how to put together a strategy or a plan or, or a business plan or execution of marketing or something like that, then maybe it's me, but I won't, I won't get into that one. But Alex is a, is a really good guy, yeah. Yeah, he's on almost all the time here yeah. uh, as he's a, one of our regular yeah. watchers. And of course he's down in Brazil, Julia. Jack Everett says, I have to admit that I was hoping her big announcement would have been about the next generation sailor. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey Jen, you're not. Yeah. Okay. Now we have to go back to you. There's not any news about that. Is there? No, no, but I did just see that Alex said I did stay there. I was like, did we stay in his house? I think we did for a couple of nights, <laughs> not the whole time, not the six weeks, but a, a period of time. Yeah. Sorry about that, Alex. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we could talk. You had asked earlier, Tom, about we could talk about the 52 Super Series really quickly because I think I might be. I did a lot. I've covered them the last three okay. years. So I might be involved with this. Stand them. by and let me go to that because that's in the next block. And uh, st stay, stay right here. Bravo Zulu. I love this. <laughs> I don't think Jack Everett likes this music or a couple of them, but come on, you got to have a little, you know, I'll, I'll cut it off. The TP, the, what, the 52, used to be called the TP52 Med Cup and various other names, but the 52 Super Series wrapped up in Cape Town today. Unfortunately, they had no wind on the final day. And Azura, on uh, the strength of a very consistent series, finished on 24 points at the head of the pack. Phoenix was second. Quantum, without presumably without Terry Hutchinson, on board, but I'm not sure of that. And on down, but uh, Azura, who was the series winner last year in 2019, has won the first regatta. There's another regatta down there in a few weeks in Cape Town before they move to Europe. And full marks to them. Bravo Zulu to these guys. They've been a tough team. They represent Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. Azura was the name of the uh, YCCS America's Cup teams in the 80s. And 70s and 80s. Well, 80s. 80s, I should say. And Jan, what do you have to say about them? Oh, I just think, I mean, it's Morning Light, which we talked about, was a TP52. And I think it's awesome to still see those boats racing at such high caliber. I love being involved with um, that series. And I thought, having seen the highlights, so they weren't live this week, but having seen the highlights, the just... Cape Town is so iconic to race in. Every time you get to see a Volvo finish, go into there or their import racing, it is beautiful to see boats in front of Table Mountain. And they got one day of the of the doctor, Cape Doctor, I think they call him. But yeah, it's like Fremantle, the, the, the really strong breeze, and they call it the Cape Doctor as well. Yeah, exactly. So I think good to see that. And I think all the teams were excited to have that. I mean, having lived in San Francisco for as long as I did, I love it when it's super windy. So I think, and then really good for Azura. So they had Santiago Lange as their tactician the last two years. And for him, it was kind of a 10 year hiatus or a long period of time between when he'd been mm. a 52 tactician before that. So he struggled the first year getting back into it. And then last year really found his groove and yet they never won a regatta, I think since 2017. So they were, but, but they did five, win the series. They did year. win the overall series, exactly. not not the world championship, which is a separate regatta part of the series. But they were the series winner last year, were they not? Yeah, they won the series all together with um, yeah five second places and and a couple other scores. But they were they were pretty far ahead for the actual overalls. But I think that's why they were just so excited here to show that they can also take a regatta win and i think probably a good i don't know the new tactician who stepped in for santiago longa i looked at the name but it's an italian name of, of someone i'm unfamiliar with so i think good to see that team come together and i think um it's going to be good racing the other the world championships as you just said is what their next event will be in cape town i think it's uh, only a couple of weeks away, maybe the end of this month coming up. But yeah, I think some... it's more than a couple of weeks, but but not much, not too much more than that. And they, I mean, you know, Cape Town. I know Cape Town from having uh, sailed there and also done meetings there. And you know, you go out to Stellenbosch out to the east and have a little little bit of uh, wine out in the Stellenbosch district. Julie, you've been to Cape Town. 
I haven't. You haven't. Well, you've got to go before you get old. Well, <laughs> you got to go before you get before you can't do it. Well, I I have. It's a ter- it's a terrific spot. Yeah, it's beautiful. You could do a you could do a live show from a cruise ship, but it presumably doesn't have coronavirus. <laughs> God, those cruise ships are. What somebody called them last night? Somebody senior said a, a a a floating petri dish. Oh, that's right. Oh man, that that didn't make it too. I've only been on one cruise, but if Jen, have you been on a cruise? Uh, no, cruise not ship a cruise? cruise ship cruise. No. Okay. Yeah, as long as they're small cruise ships, they're seaboard size. They're fine. Well, that's your favorite, isn't it? Yes. Okay, let me carry on here because Bravo Zulu to Luna or to Azura rather for their win in the first regatta of the fifty-two Super Series. They're in the shadow of Table Mountain. Well, they would really wouldn't be in the shadow unless they were out there early in the morning because it's obviously they're sailing to the west. Uh, congratulations also to these guys. They won. They represent the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia, the Youth World Match Racing Champs, which are hosted by the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, Harry Hodgson, Harry Hall, Louis Schofield, and Nick, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Rosenauers, I guess, Rosenauers, representing Australia and the Cruising Yacht Club. And they had a great series, consistent series, against some very tough competition. And they are the Youth match racing world champions for 2020 runners up some cool guys you probably know these guys as well jen julie you'll be very proud because i think all of them except bram brackman go to stanford i'm not a hundred percent but jacob rosenberg uh, there on the left wiley rogers who we know in fact i talked to wiley yesterday or the day before victoria thompson jack park and bram brackman i think those first four are, are all attending Stanford on the Stanford sailing team. And I, I hear, I'm not 100% sure that Bram is a Tufts University sailing team member. Do you know that, Jen, of one way or another? No, I'm not that familiar with the um, current college sailors at the moment. So good to see a lot of Stanford guys out there, but I don't know Bram particularly. Well, okay. Well, full marks to both of them. Bravo, Zulu. They're, the competition was tough. Uh, Leslie Egnot Johnson's son, EJ, Nick EJ, as they call him, was, I think, third, third or fourth. And there were others that uh, of who are often on here watching the show. And we, we just could not be prouder of what is a fine group of sailors and a great discipline in our sport, not only match racing, but youth match racing, that Australia, New Zealand, uh, Southern California, a little bit now in Northern California, and increasingly in the UK and a few other countries, is growing and it's fun, it's competitive, it is uh, obviously very instructive for people to learn how to do. You're smiling there, yeah. right? You... I mean, I think match racing is amazing. I think you've learned so much more about what you can do with the rules of sailing that you can then apply to any other parts of exactly. sailing, whether it's the starting line of an offshore race or any fleet racing of dinghies. I think it is it is a really fun part of the sport that not enough people get to take take part in. And, and you know, Dave Perry has been the Pied Piper of match racing in this country, and to some degree, you might say that Tommy, uh, not Tommy Slingsby, uh, the younger brother of Jimmy Spithill, Tommy Spithill, is he the younger brother? I think he is the younger brother. Any of it. They're, they're more or less the yeah, same age. So. But Tommy Spithill has been the, the guru and Pied Piper in Australia in many ways. And what a fantastic, I couldn't agree more, Jen. It's a great, great discipline, great teaching tool for our sport. And I wish more clubs and classes for that matter and countries were involved. And one hears there might be a return that we, we hosted the World Youth Match Racing Championship at Balboa Yacht Club uh, in conjunction a couple of weeks after Governor's Cup. And we'll see if there maybe is a return of yes. that event. I hear there's discussion of that going on. Okay, the famous Olympics where Jen's going to be a commentator. We hope it goes on. I will say again that whatever they do, and there's increasingly there's more to talk with each passing week about having to postpone it or even cancel it. I hope these people figure, and are I'm sure they are working on a way to slice it up if they can't run it in Tokyo in one big deal slice the sports up move them to venues that can hold a smaller regatta or postpone it and in the contract i know for a fact and you've it's been reported in the press but i also hear talking with senior serious ioc people that it is possible under the contract to delay the event 
through the end of this calendar year because of force majeure, or as we would say, an act of God. And we might use that in a contract here in the U.S., but force majeure is, tends to be the, the language in contracts outside of the U.S. So we'll see what happens, but it's, you know, it's, it's a problem. It's obviously a problem, and you want to be rather safe than sorry. And, of course, we know Italy is the hardest-hit country, and we feel sorry for anyone who's been affected. And I, I now have talked to a friend and his wife who I think, they think, they think they've had it. And they're, they're young. They're in their 40, late 40s, early, well, she's 40, he's 50. And they thought they had a bad case of flu that turned into pneumonia. And this was before it was widely understood that this thing was out and about in the world. This was in January. And now they don't have test kits, so they can't find out. No one's going to give them a test kit because they don't have enough of them around. But they say, wow, now we think, because they were really sick five days. And I'm sure there are others. And maybe some people on here watching it right now have had it, and we don't, you don't even know it because that seems to be the case for a lot of people. Okay. Any other comments, Julia? I see Clark Chapin is saying, Chaos Kim has zero credibility, and there's no telling the additional financial or organizational damage he can do between now and October, November. I think that's right. Yeah. Lake Milton says, cheers, Jenny, and thanks for stepping up to chat today about your adventures. Right on. And Jack, yeah, well, you talked about Jack Everett. Commodore John McNeil is watching. Steve Groover, I had them when I lived in St. Thomas and ended up needing them after all, them all after Hugo. And I think he's talking about today's sponsor. Okay, that's a joke. It's not really, today's show is not brought to you by Clorox <laughs> wipes. Although I, I do have two. Welcome the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, anybody else? Any other comments? Uh, only only a repeat of, uh, do take the time to read the, the comments because there's some pithy ones and some fun ones and a couple instructional ones. So Yeah. Chris Welsh is saying, nice dining room. <laughs> <laughs> Are we saying happy birthday back? He's just left for Newport Beach um, earlier this morning where he is celebrating his birthday with his brother who also has the same birthday, although two years later. So how that happens is uh, crazy. Yeah, happy <laughs> birthday. Ha indeed, but, happy yeah. birthday to Chris Welsh. It's indeed. an auspicious few days, this day in history and yesterday and the day before. Congrats, Jenny. Josh Tozo is saying, the esteemed marketing director, for U.S. sailing. Very exciting program and adventure with Airbnb. Best of luck. And on and on and on. Okay. Uh, we'll carry on here and see what, uh, what we do next Tuesday. I do not have a guest currently scheduled, but there's a lot of interest and in people have asked me, well, would you please have somebody on? Or come? I can actually do a split screen now on the, on the YouTube, uh, YouTube, on the uh, Skype and put more than one person on. In fact, I think I can do a quad screen now. Skype keeps modernizing. Microsoft, now that they've owned Skype, keep modernizing. Jen, thank you very much indeed. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to see you. Great to see you, and great to have you on the show from across the bay in Richmond, California. Safe safe travels tonight. Thanks. Thank yeah. You. Ciao, have bye. A good one. Okay, that pretty well wraps it up. Julie, anything else? No. Oh, yes. One thing. Don't forget, it's not too late to like, share, and subscribe this program. Although somebody, actually, there is one thing, because we have to better check this. Steve Gruber said he didn't miss the live, but I do miss the full replay, which means he may not be getting the full replay for some reason. So I don't know why that is, because, uh, yeah, please like, share, and subscribe, and become a patron over on the main website, sailingillustrated.com, if you're so inclined. We appreciate that. But the point is that we are now, immediately we go off the air now here in the next minute or so, this show is available for replay on Facebook. It takes me an hour or so to upload the show. I do a little carve of the st at the start so you don't have to listen to all the music in the intro in the replay on YouTube. So I do a, a little bit of a trim, upload it to YouTube, and it's available there in an hour or two later this afternoon, as are now all of our previous shows at least the most recent previous shows, on our Sailing Illustrated TV YouTube page. And if you're trying to find any of this, all you have to do is simply Google TFE Live, and up pops on the Google search our Sailing Illustrated, all of our Sailing Illustrated and TFE Live 
pages, including Sailing Illustrated's Facebook page. You can also contribute via PayPal. We appreciate that very much at Sailing Illustrated. That's paypal.me slash Sailing Illustrated. And we want to thank everyone for their contributions today, images, videos, and audio, our musical selections. And that's about it. We hope that you have a great weekend, that you're back with us on Tuesday, same time, same channel. And until then, sail fast, sail safe, and have fun. Ciao.